PhD candidate at University of Texas, Austin. His uh, research is on robust decision making in large scale systems with focus on theoretical aspects of learning and computation. And he's currently focusing on developing efficient learning algorithms, reinforcement learning algorithms in partially observable domains, which is something what he's going to talk about today, I believe. So let's, uh, let me give it up to Chong for his talk on reinforcement learning in latent MDPs. Thank you very much. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank the organizers for having me on this great seminar series. I am very grateful for this opportunity. So today I'm going to talk about latent MDPs, uh, which is a framework for reinforcement learning when there are some latent factors in the environment. And this is a joint work with my great collaborators, Jonathan, Konstantin, and Shai. So let's get started. Reinforcement learning is a central problem in machine learning where an agent learns by interacting with the environment, by taking actions and getting a feedback in the form of new observations and rewards. And as many of us know, uh, recent years have seen a great success of reinforcement learning, uh, achieving the superhuman level performance in various challenging tasks, such as in the game of Go. So many successful reinforcement learning applications uh, deal with the environment where all necessary information is always available. We call such environments are fully observable, as in most Atari games. Uh, in such environments, all that matters is the current observation of the system to make the best possible decision, which means the problem is in the Markovian regime. Uh, but there are many applications that this may not be the case. So some important information may be missing. And in this work, we want to consider this type of scenario, namely an environment with a non-observable non identifier of the system or latent context. Uh, so here is a made-up example of a medical decision-making problem. Here, a doctor is an agent and he wants to give prescriptions to several patients who shows common symptoms of cough, fever, runny nose, and so on. And the, the latent context here is the underlying disease, which can be flu, allergy, or even COVID. Now, depending on the underlying disease, the treatment may be significantly different. So the doctor, uh, whenever he gives a prescription, he not only considers uh, the current observation, which is the symptoms that patient shows, but also the pos all possibilities of uh, uh, the underlying contexts, uh, which we attempt to infer from a short-term medi <clears throat> short medical histories, such as uh, whether the fever went down by a light medication or not. So this means the problem is no longer in a Markovian regime, even when there is just one single latent variable. So in this work, we consider, in order to handle this type of applications, uh, we consider the framework of latent Markov decision process, or latent MDPs. Latent MDP consists of several MDPs, uh, where each MDP is defined on a joint state space and action space. And each MDP has its own uh, transition kernel, reward probability, and initial state distribution. Uh, for notation-wise, we use T for transition kernel, R for reward probability, and NU for initial state distribution. And for the reward, uh, to simplify the uh, presentation, we uh, assume it is a binary valued. But in this work, uh, any structured reward distribution um, uh, <clears throat> might be the same. And we consider an episodic reinforcement learning problem where an environment is reset after every H times of interactions. And at the beginning of the episode, a latent context, which is a small m here, is sampled from uh, some mixing probabilities. And then for that episode, the agent interacts with the mth MDP. But the agent cannot see 
the context directly. So it doesn't know with which NDP that it is interacting with. Uh, the goal is to find the, find the optimal policy, which maximizes the expected long-term rewards, as in many reinforcement learning problems. And here for the policy, we consider not only the Markovian policies, so a bigger class of policies that maps an entire history to an action. So as some of you have noticed, this is a special case of the partially observable NDPs or POM DPs uh, with a single non-changing hidden variable. So this is pre yes. Sorry, yeah, I, I I didn't want to interrupt, but I think it's it's like central. The definition. Can you go back to the definition and yes, I just wanted to ask, like, what's the significance of multiplying it with this WM? Like, how how do you think of this objective? Oh, so so uh, the the. The definition of the long-term average, long uh, or is um, <clears throat> so basically it's an expectation over the whole thing, but I somehow unfold it so that it is a uh, the mixing probability times the expected reward uh, in the in each MDP. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, okay. So, yeah, this is a special case of POM DPs. But even if this is a simplified, uh, si simplified special case, this problem turns out to be not so simple. For example, uh, there is a computational hardness results in planning, which is finding the policy when when you have the actual true model descriptions. Uh, it is known to be at least and be hard because the optimal policy here is no longer Markovian. And uh, in many cases, planning exactly in such environment is known to be at least and be hard. On the statistical side, the, this problem has not been even explored much. So uh, we know it is, uh, it is well known that by now well known, understood that a general POM DP requires an exponential number of samples um, in the worst case, in the time horizon. But for latent MDPs, uh, we are not sure whether the same lower bound should be the case uh, because we have some more structure here. So in this work, uh, we are mostly interested in these statistical challenges uh, for, learning late, for learning in latent MDPs. Uh, we are not the first to uh, consider this framework. So there are previous work uh, which considered the computational complexity of planning in latent MDPs when, when the true model is given. So as mentioned, the exact planning is still MP hard. So this uh, previous work uh, uh, studied uh, an approximate planning mechanisms and existing solutions uh, up to date uh, includes point-based value iteration or mixed integer programming if we restrict our focus on memoryless policies. But since our focus is not on the computational or planning aspect, uh, we'll assume that uh, we can use any existing pla uh, planning algorithms uh, as a black box whenever we need it. And there are another line of work that studied the sample complexity of reinforcement learning in latent NDPs but with a sort of strong assumption, uh, which is uh, with a very long time horizon with some other assumptions. So in their settings, uh, they, it is, these assumptions sort of enables um, to learn one MDP model at a sing, in a single episode. So which simplifies uh, the land problem. Uh, so our work is differentiated from these previous works uh, in that we consider the sample complexity. Uh, so basically we study the replacement learning in the online setting without strict assumptions on the time horizon. And uh, let me briefly compare our work from 
different line of works on the sample complexity of other class of POMDPs. So as uh, mentioned, the general POMDP requires exponential number of samples in the time horizon. So the previous work uh, focused on the special case where the observation space is statistically sufficient, meaning that the minimum eigenvalue of the state observation matrix is uh, greater than zero. This kind of assumption is a common non-degeneracy non assumption to apply method of moments, such as predictive state representation or tensor decompositions. There is also a recent work that studies an efficient exploration strategy in this setting. Uh, likewise, this previous work mostly focused on the case where the observation space is larger than the underlying state space. Whereas uh, we want to understand the opposite case uh, and still hope for, we still hope for uh, tractable solutions when there are structures in the problem. So uh, back to the latent MDPs. Uh, so we want to answer the two main questions on learning on the sample complexity of, of rate plus pattern learning in LMDPs. The first question is, uh, whether we can learn a good enough policy uh, after only a polynomial number of interactions with the environment. And the spoiler alert is uh, the answer is no, unfortunately. So, and then we want to consider which assumptions might lead the problem to an efficient learning strategy. And we'll try to provide some positive answers on this question. Uh, before I proceed to the main body, uh, I would like to clarify some set, some questions on settings or backgrounds, if there is any. Uh, yeah, so actually, Amy Zhang was asking in the questions, how is this exactly related to the setting of contextual MDPs uh, by yes. HALAC 2015? So contextual MDP, oh, HALAC, ha, you mean HALAC, OK. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, this is the, this is the work that considered this problem the same framework but with a long time horizon. So there, you need to assume that the time horizon is great, greater than at least greater than the the number of states times actions, and also it, they need something like the um, finite diameter each empty piece. So basically, with that all the assumptions combined you can visit every state and actions multiple times in a single episode. Um, uh, but that does sound like the same setting as what you consider here. It's just that, well, they make strong assumptions. So the framework is the same, but- Or the, the algorithm needs strong assumptions, rather. Algorithm, yeah, yeah. And the nature of the problem is pretty much different because they're basically what, what they do is estimate the, uh, everything in a single episode and try to cluster the, the well, in, well enough learned models. Here, we cannot learn a single model in a single episode. Um, so we need to combine um, a, a, a spread information uh, across different episodes. Um, and that's, that, that, co that, makes a, that makes a huge difference, actually. OK, OK, I see. So I have a quick follow up on this. So, so, so does that mean effectively that this previous work was something like a long time horizon and yours is more like episodic setting where you are repeating small, small length episodes multiple times? Yes, yes. Um, okay. And also I, want, I have a more general question about your setting. Um, is, is, is the W's known or you learned, you would learn them? Oh, uh, so in this work, we assume that WM is just one over M equally, but okay. uh, in our setting, so so for this work only, <clears throat> that doesn't that is not uh, a problem. Normally, for for more clever, more challenging settings, that might be the problem. But in this setting, that we we just assume it's one over M, and it does not make huge difference. But if if more general settings that you are thinking about there, you would know these Ws or you would learn them? So um, I think we, um, 
I can maybe clarify after I state uh, what what assumptions I assume and uh, uh, what results are like. Um, but basically here, I will assume, you can just assume these mixing weights are known and possibly just one over M. Um, and we want, we, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, the learning with the mixing weights is uh, not the main focus, uh, so. And even if we don't know, we, we, um, for, for this work specifically, uh, it, doesn't, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't make a uh, huge difference on, on the results that we are trying to show here. So uh, yeah, yeah, I guess, I, I, okay. underst I understand that when the meeting rates are unknown, the problem is more challenging, but um, for this work, um, yeah. yeah, I suppose this should be clear once you present like your exact assumptions and your algorithm and all that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh... <clears throat> So uh, I will start with the lower bound results. <clears throat> um, the, so initially we approached the lower bound uh, from the perspective of learning mixture models. Uh, so latent and DP can be co considered as a type of mixture problems, uh, a mixture of MDPs. And typically the lower bound for many mixture problems in the worst case are given by uh, some something exponential in the number of components. But hopefully in other parameters, uh, we would expect uh, the polynomial dependency. So for example, in Gaussians, we have exponential dependency in the number of components, um, but we still have some polynomial dependency in ambient dimensions or so on. So whether that would be the case for latent MDPs. And it turns out that uh, the case is even worse for learning in latent MDPs. So um, <clears throat> we find that in order to get a good enough policy, uh, we need at least SA to the M samples. And this is also the case, even if we restrict uh, the policy classes to a, for example, memoryless policies. And SA to the M can be quite large, uh, even for a moderate size of the system and a reasonable number of contexts. So uh, the lesson, here, the main takeaway here is that if we want some smart, efficient learning algorithms with a growing number of contexts, then we must have some assumptions. So for the few, next few slides, I'd like to investigate uh, which assumptions might be sufficient for efficient learning. And for the lower bound constructions, uh, we will see later. So please bear with me. Uh, so wait a second, I have a question about yes. this. So here your lower bound says SA over M to the M. Yes, yes. So what, is this increasing in M? No, uh, increasing, right? So yeah, I, I haven't uh, given, uh, so yeah, I'm a little bit hand wavy here, but uh, M, the, when I state this result, I sort of considering M as something much smaller than the number of states. So M is, um, so S, so you can think of it as, S as something greater than M. But the, the main point is uh, the sample oh, is yeah, exponential in the number of the components. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, under under the assumption that S is also like large, yeah, 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 comparable to M. So okay, because because here you're saying that well, for efficient learning with growing M, you need assumptions. Well, I guess and like one assumption is that well, the size of the state space is fixed, mm -hmm. and then and then all seems to be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. I guess. Um... It's not mentioned here, but age is fixed here. The horizon. Oh, oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, 
I yeah, I, I also uh we, we didn't also have given a special care to the time horizon. Um H so in our lower bound instances, H is basically equal to M. But uh, okay. Uh, how about decoupling them? Do you know whether is should it be the minimum of H and M actually in the oh in the exponent? And, yes, it is. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. So in the exponent, it it should be H minimum if, of H and M. Yeah. If if H is fixed and constant, then M can okay. be like. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Can we match this lower bound with an upper bound? I guess we can, right? Uh, so, in, in case H is smaller than M, then I guess it's easy because we can just consider all possible histories. I guess, uh, so yeah, I, I'll actually later uh, state that, but uh for 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 the instances with some some subclasses of latent mdps we can match the lower bound and upper bound uh but for general latent mdps i think uh it is an open problem whether we can get uh, sa to the m upper bound could i also ask a very basic question uh, yes so i think you you mentioned this lower bounds i believe this lower bound should hold so when you actually don't know the transition and the rewards for each mdp mm -hmm. i'm wondering for easier case like for example if you know the transition and reward for each mdp but you don't know the mixing weights and so what is is it still hard or it's actually easy I think I haven't considered that case. Um, um, sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, well, that's cool, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, can I move on? Is, is there any questions? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, we, so for now, uh, we want to consider some, some assumptions that, that leads us to a efficient learning strategy. So, uh, yeah, why don't we start with some easy settings? And here we want to start with this warm up scenario, which is uh, as the following. So, Let's say we work with domain experts. So during the episode, still the agent cannot see the context. Um, but after the at the end of episode, uh, the, there is a domain expert who reveals the true context. So recalling the medical example, this might be the case when a, when a novice doctor gives prescriptions to patients while he's waiting for some analysis report of a thorough examination. And waiting for the result of the examination, he still might have to give some prescriptions. So this case might be, uh, might correspond to the, this form of case. And in that settings, uh, we want to uh, see two main points. First is, uh, with this help of uh, access to true context, can we achieve the polynomial sample complexity? And the second one is, uh, is there an oracle efficient implementation? Here, oracle refers to the planning oracle, approximate planning oracle that solves one model at a time. And by oracle efficient, we want a polynomial number of calls to this planning oracle uh, while we are running the algorithm. And one thing I wanted to mention is that this is from just learning M separate MDPs, because still during the episode, the agent doesn't know with which MDP it is interacting with. Uh, so the exploration strategy is different, should be different from the case when you know the context from the beginning. I wish this warm up scenario is clear.
Okay. Um, I'm assuming it is clear. Uh, we want to think about the algorithm. Uh, so we just remind that uh, most efficient reinforcement learning of algorithms are rooted on the principle of optimisms. And in the spirit of optimism principle, we always execute the policy for a model with the highest rewards in the confidence set. So in partially observable settings, the confidence set, the construction of the confidence set itself is a challenge uh, because it is not always obvious how to construct it. Uh, but when we have a, a true context in hindsight, we can bypass that first challenge. So uh, after, after the episode, since we are getting the true context, uh, we can construct our estimates of each model parameters. Uh, here, the symbols with head refers to empirical quantities. And we know that the, the true model parameter is going to be within uh, one of our root n confidence intervals around the empirical estimators. Uh, here, n of m of s, comma a is the number of visit counts that how many times I visited state a, s, action a in the nth MDP. So in the warm-up scenario, we get a we get a confidence set sort of for free. Now the remaining thing is to compute the optimistic policy. And the optimistic policy is the policy that is for the model with the highest rewards in the confidence set. So we need to basically solve this uh, nested max-max problem. Uh, solving this max-max problem is not always easy, unlike in bandit case. So uh, uh, we need some other idea to solve the, it's getting this optimistic policy. Uh, so instead, usually we design a, a single model, single optimistic model, so that the value, uh, the, the expected long-term rewards in that model for any policy is greater than uh, any other models in the confidence set. And this, this optimistic model may not be contained in the, in the confidence set, but as long as we can tie it to the regret bound, uh, we are fine. And once we can construct such a single model, we can just use the planning oracle by giving this uh, single model as an input. So basically, we can decouple the challenges in uh, iterating over the confidence set and planning over it. And so now the remaining question is how to construct that single model. So the construction of the optimist set, optimistic model is actually simple. We can use uh, an empirically estimated model parameters and a new, new notion of the hidden rewards. So the hidden rewards here means that this reward uh, is not visible to the agent. Uh, so it does not appear in any history, but still it's a reward that, that, that you get and you target to uh, maximize. So yeah, this is the natural form of the exploration bonus, but in an invisible form. And in partially observable settings, this concept of hidden makes a little difference because normally in partially observable settings, we, we update our belief over latent variables, which is latent context here, as we accumulate more observations in a single episode. Uh, but when something is hidden, then it does not affect our belief over context. So, but, but the reward is still there. So now uh, you may wonder the, whether the planning oracle can handle this new notion of hidden rewards. And in fact, yes, uh, it can easily incorporate uh, this hidden part, uh, like for example, the point-based value iterations or mixed integer programming. Um, they, can, they can handle this. They can plan over maximize, they can plan to maximize the long-term rewards, long-term observable plus hidden rewards. So in a nutshell, uh, we can construct the optimistic model from the solved quantities and and that single model decouples uh the nested max max optimization problem and so we can obtain an efficient oracle efficient algorithm 
So putting them all together, uh, we I can we can quickly yes, ask yes. some clarification question. Yes, yes. So the way I would have thought about going about this is that since the latent state is revealed at the end, maybe you can estimate the weights of these uh, MDPs, uh, like what the, what the, what is the, the the probability of each MDP appearing. Maybe you assume it's known to simplify things further. And then all that is left is maybe rather than being like constructing a, like what is a single model here? A single model means one model for each of the MDPs. And maybe this is what you're doing, but it was not quite clear to me. And for so, each so. of the MDPs, you just add some bonuses uh, that appear in the form of like virtual rewards. And then you are running your planning oracle for, for these. So it's kind of like a relaxation of, of this uh, initial state optimism thing. Uh, because now we kind of push everything into the value functions and uh, or, or the rewards like the uh, kind of the the exploration uh, incentivization just appears in the rewards, and then you feed this to the planning oracle. And is the, is that what you're doing? So, so the single the model refers uh, I mean, it refers to the latent MDP model. So right. one latent MDP model for that contains all MDPs. Right, and right. Yes, you're right. Uh, the, I, I'm basically putting the, all the exploration bonus into a into a reward part. So, okay. so when the planning oracle computes some approximate algorithms, mm -hmm. it will encounter uh, it. It will account for this hidden part. And so, if you think about the MDP setting, this is just an exploration bonus in the value iteration of Q functions. Uh, but now, but but the the reason I'm putting this uh, into the reward part is now we cannot exactly run the value iteration, so right. instead I'm just leaving it to the planning oracle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. So I'm just I'm just wondering about the terminology here. Like, why do you call these hidden rewards and not just an exploration bonus? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it, so <clears throat> both is right. It's, it's exploration mm -hmm. bonus. The reason I want to say, uh, something about hidden is because, uh, in the partially observable settings, you, you get, so usually the policy for partially observable environment is a mapping from an entire history to policy. Uh, but since so, some hidden part will never appear in the, uh, in the history. So when you compute the policy, uh, this hidden reward part uh, will not be given as an input uh, in the poll in the history. So there is there is a subtle difference that uh, how you compute the policy. Um, so 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 the history is now only a sequence of states, actions, and real rewards. Right, right. And and you're mapping this to actions. So when right. deciding what directions you're not taking the bonus into account. I'm wondering about whether the planner like is thinking this way or the planner is given these bonuses. I, I my understanding was that the planner is given the bonuses. Oh yeah. So mo in the model description, so the planner just plans over the model. Uh, it, it's just about the output of the this planning oracle. So your policy. I see. The, the planning oracle is restricted mm -hmm. to policies that do not depend on this uh, unknown uh, reward because, of course, the identity of M is not going to be known. Exactly, yes. Right, but then this sounds like a very unusual oracle to me that uh, it, it is given some extra side information of these hidden rewards that is allowed to use when constructing its output, but the output itself is not allowed to depend on these. Okay, that's. And solid. now comes the argument that yes, you can with point-based value iteration, whatnot, <laughs> you can implement this, right? Uh, yes. Okay. So let's continue. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying questions. Um, yeah. So uh, putting them all together, uh, we can propose our latent upper confidence reinforcement learning algorithms. It is processed as follows. So it's a, basically a slight variation of the original UCLA algorithm. 
but now um, so first at the at the beginning of every episode we construct an optimistic model uh, using the empirical quantities and visit counts and we feed it to the planning oracle to get a to get a policy to be to execute for this episode and then we run the policy and now at the end of episode uh, the domain expert gives you the true context and with that we can again update our visit counts and empirical model estimators so this is the algorithm um, now the regret guarantees uh, for the regret, we defined it as the summation over all episodes uh, of the expected value guaranteed by the planning oracle uh, when you are in the true model minus uh, the value expected value uh, when you for the policy that you executed. And the regret guarantee is given by HS square root MAN. So basically, it's a root n type uh, regret bound with polynomial factors in all parameters. Or equivalently, we can say that we achieved a polynomial sample complexity. So the main takeaway, main, main takeaway here is that uh, there is an exponential gap in the sample complexity when you don't assume anything and try to solve the problem as it is, whereas uh, the and and versus the setting where you can you you get a help uh, from the access to to the context even though it's in hindsight. Uh, so uh, for for next steps, uh, we want to see uh, which assumptions might uh, be which options might be available if we don't access to the true context. But I want to clarify any uh, unclear points up to this point. Just as a clarification, I'm probably missing something, but if if I extended the action space to create, let's say, one dummy action for every model, uh, for every M, mm -hmm. and, and, and that action basically takes you in a different transition model that you don't know, right? So, so a dummy action M takes you to transitions according to model M. Is that not like that? So that kind of reduction doesn't work? Like what's the intuition? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, what's, what's the uh, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not changing the, like, I'm not creating the, but, but can I view the problem like that? Like that there is, so if I use the same techniques, but I keep track of, so so you're cre you're kind of creating this uh, optimistic MDP right. by look considering like impossible models, right? That you could be coming from. I could also think like I was wondering if there is a reduction possible to th uh, to think about like where you can think about like there are impossible actions, like every action actually represents m possible actions and you're taking one of them you don't know which model it'll which action you're really taking like the regret bounds also seem like they are coming like they're making the action space m times a in some sense mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's a maybe we can talk about it later maybe in the discussion yeah, it's it, a, yeah, yeah. yes yes i would like to hear that yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, and uh, I I'm I'm sorry that uh, I have another an immediate answer. Uh, okay, uh, so I, I'll just go go ahead. Um, yeah, so for now uh, we want to now now let's say we don't have an access to true context in hindsight. Uh, it, normally we wouldn't get it for free, so. Instead, uh, we wonder whether we can infer the context. And of course, in general, there would be no shortcut to the inference because of the lower bound that we have seen, lower bound result that we have seen. But 
Under some assumptions, uh, the inference of the context is possible, namely the separation and some coarse initialization. Uh, uh, and so what I propose here are just some sufficient conditions uh, where the correct inference of the context becomes possible. So the first condition is a good initialization of the model. Um, so here, I want, the, I want to start the model estimate uh, from somewhere close to the true parameters. Uh, but here, and here, epsilon zero is some small constant. But still, it may not be too small uh, to be able to get good enough policy. So anyway, we want to refine models and policies as we get more data uh, from the environment. And the second condition is the separation. Uh, I'm basically asking that all trajectories, all, all the distribution of trajectories uh, are far enough uh, in, each, in different MDPs. So basically, I want a large KL divergence in the distribution of trajectories for any policy. And if we uh, have this, if we have these two conditions, uh, we can show that we can infer the context correctly with high probability. And in such case, we can get a similar regret bound as in the worm of case where we obtain the true context in hindsight. So for now, uh, I uh, let, let's see how we can infer the context given those two assumptions. So there is actually a systematic way of incorporate, inferring the context and incorporating the result uh, to update the model parameters, um, namely the expectation maximization algorithm, which is my favorite one. Uh, so uh, to briefly explain, uh, the EM algorithm of co consists of two steps, where in the E step, uh, we estimate the posterior probability of latent variables given the observation. And the latent variable in latent MDP is the context, and the observation is the entire trajectory for, for one episode. And the, in the M step, we update the model parameter. Um, and in latent MDP, what we do is basically we are increasing the visit count uh, by not just plus one or zero, but by the amount uh, that almost to how much you believe in that context. And uh, under the previous two conditions, you can show that the inference at the E step is correct, which means this estimate of the belief is close to some one hot vectors where the most probability math is uh, given to only to the true context. And in such, in such case, again, we can obtain the similar regret bounds. And so uh, we can incorporate the EM implementation into the original LUCRL algorithm. So the first three steps remain the same. We construct the optimistic model. We call the planning oracle by uh, calling to get the optimal, to get the returned policy. And then using that policy, we interact with the environment for that episode. Now at the end of the episode, instead of getting a true context, we estimate a belief over context. And then we update our visit counts weighted by a belief in each context. So it's not strictly one or zero, but some fractional numbers. And then uh, using this uh, visit counts, we can update our model estimates. And uh, I would say that empirically, it seems to work much better than what we can guarantee in theory. But yeah, uh, for better theoretical understanding, we need uh, much more uh, study uh, about this implementation. So I suppose I suppose you're only updated, only updating the counts of the transitions that you actually observed, right? <clears throat> right. So for only the observed SAS prime triples. Oh, so I only uh, stated one uh, update. Here we also update the visit counts, the, the, the number of times we see 
are given as a and also the initial state and right. also and the mixing probability and, and and you only do like one single e step and one single m step so so not multiple yeah not so multiple doing multiple would not really make sense it's uh it's not multiple what yeah, yeah, so I guess that would be, yeah, so you just infer b hat of m, right? Yeah. Using the current model, and then you update your counts with that. And then yeah. you just use this model to calculate like a new estimate of b hat, and you just replace your previous b hat with this. Could this make more sense? Oh, so it, uh, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I don't specifically update the previous estimate of the beliefs with the new mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just, um, I guess that's that's the online EM implementation. I, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah, I think I got it. Uh -huh. Thank you. Nice. So um, <clears throat> let me briefly go over some assumptions that uh, whenever these conditions are possible, namely the initialization and separation. Um, and here again, this is just uh, sufficient conditions. So for the separation, what we wanted is a large KL divergence bit, this KL divergence in the distribution of trajectories. And one sufficient condition to ensure that is some non-zero total variation distance uh, between different MDPs uh, in one step observations. So basically what I'm saying is we want all MDPs to behave somewhat differently at all time steps. For the initialization condition, uh, we may ask uh, how to get a good initialization. And yes, it is possible under some assumptions like uh, when the all MDPs are ergodic and uh, if all short observations are statistically sufficient. In such case, we can apply some existing methods, general tools for learning POMDPs. Uh, I would say these conditions are not too terrible because still some problems are studied under these conditions. And if we assume, if we have the luxury of these assumptions, then we can apply the existing methods such as predictive state representation. And then we can convert that representation to a well-initialized model after which we can run the LU setup plus EM. But I also admit that um, these conditions might be restrictive in some applications. So we think it is, it is very important to think about what are the, which are the milder and useful conditions uh, that enables some initialization. And we wanna study that in the future. So for here, uh, we want to show the empirical performance of LU Seattle plus EM. Uh, the first we, we run some experiments on the toy problems. In the first experiment, um, it is to see the importance of getting true context in hindsight. So here we, we run uh, the LU Seattle with assuming the, uh, the access to true context in hindsight. And one time, uh, LU Seattle plus EM. Uh, when we don't have an access to the true context. But this time, once with the good initialization and once without good initialization. And what we can see in these two plots with red lines is that whenever the model is not very initialized, EM sends the model parameters to some local optimums, which is followed by some suboptimal convergence to a suboptimal policy. But when we, when we have either the access to true context or starting from a good initialization, then the performance of LU CRL was much more superior. So then next we measured the performance of LU CRL plus EM under various separation conditions, assuming some good initialization is given to see how the separation assumption is critical. Uh, so whenever we gave a, a good initialization, it seemed like, like the EM algorithm converges to true parameters reasonably stably. 
regardless of the amount of separations um, we gave. And whenever the EM converges well, the LU style also uh, uh, able to find a good policy um, quite stably. So we think uh, what we learned here is that it seems empirically uh, more critical condition seems like an initialization of the model parameters, uh, regardless of the separation assumptions. And we would like to see uh, if that's still be the, that's also the case for more realistic applications um, in future. Uh, so uh, for the remaining time, I would like to walk through the lower bound construction of the lower bound instances, uh, but I would like to take any questions up to this point. Okay. Uh, just one, I wanted one clarification on the results. So the, the EM algorithm that you have, it has the same upper bound results or is it like an equivalent implementation or is it does it require a different analysis from the LUCRL? Is, uh, is he frozen? Zhuang, are you there? Ouch. Uh, hopefully he comes back. That question was putting him off, off the line. I would have expected that. I guess we can wait uh, a little bit for sure. Yeah, it's going to reconnect. The first time this happens. Oh, well, we have the slides. You can go over them together. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't show up. Yeah. Do we have a god? <laughs> what happened in Austin? <laughs> okay, he's back, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> at which point am I disconnected? No worries, yeah. Should I again ask yeah. question again? <laughs> okay. But, uh, I, I was just asking if the upper bound that you show applies to both the algorithms, like, or is are the equivalent algorithms just implementation difference? Or? Oh, yeah. So the up, so under some assumptions, we can show that, yeah, under some assumptions, the same uh, regret bounds of. Uh, is for the both settings. Yeah, but then I'm wondering, like, how does how does epsilon and delta and how do how do these parameters appear in the bound that you're getting? Oh, um, so they they matters. So so for my my for in my uh, guarantee, I uh, I only gave it only in the case when the inference of contexts are correct, and in that case, uh, this delta or epsilon zero. Uh, does not appear in the regular bounds, but but I'm sure that uh, maybe if we, if the inference of the context is not always correct, maybe we have more dependency. I I can I I imagine that. So inference is correct in every episode. Yes, yes. I, I'm I'm giving that. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I'm I'm not deriving a new theorem for this uh, algorithm particularly. Uh, wait, okay. wait. So you mean the crack means the belief actually like is a is a like is one zero 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 something like exactly, that. Exactly. Yeah, something very very close to that. Well. Okay. So when you say like KL to be something very large, you actually don't have some theorems saying like when KL is large enough or greater than some threshold, you can actually do it. Uh, I, I yeah yeah I didn't state it, it in terms of the KL divergence. Uh, okay, but, but then why you choose KL divergence as a separation here? Like, why not other things like chi square? Oh, I, I thought um, this is um, 
so this is for the explanation. And so actually what we what uh, I required is some delta and the number of observations per episode. And uh, but basically this this non this these things in combination uh, is to to make the KL divergence large. So it's it's which is from my intuition, but uh, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So, okay. so, 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 just intuitively, like, so in the L LUCRL, you are implicitly estimating the context in some sense, right? Like, there's no explicit estimation, whereas in the EM algorithm, you have this es explicit estimation. And from the experiments, you believe that's better. Like, what's the intuition um, of? It seems like the theoretical results are more manageable with LUCRL and I mean, it doesn't need additional condition. So do you think it's like problem dependent versus problem independent kind of thing happening here? Like what's the intuition behind it being? Oh, there? so so there is a difference, differences. Here we are getting a true context, no matter how your model is well initialized, or how much separation you're having. So, so, but here, here, you're estimating the belief, and if you want to reuse the theorem for in the first case, you you um, you need some 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 guarantee that the inference is correct. But otherwise, I guess so. Basically, the the challenge is the the analysis of the expectation maximization algorithm, uh, and you have smaller separation or no no good initialization. All right, so I suggest that you, you just tell us about your lower bound construction then, and then we can yeah. continue discussing. Also, yes. After. Uh, okay. So this is the only technical part. Um, uh, so yeah, in a nutshell, we can find this lower bound example uh, in the instances where, where all MDPs have deterministic transitions and rewards. But still, the context is sampled every at the beginning of every episode with equal probability. And so uh, we are going to set up the scenario so that uh, only at the first MDP and only under the correct sequence of actions uh, we'll get a reward. Uh, so here uh, I'll set up the time horizon to be equal to the number of con con contexts, um, and so. All I need to do is finding this correct action sequence. For all other action sequence, you get a reward zero. And now all other MDPs uh, gives no rewards. They are just there to confuse this correct action sequence. So uh, what I would like to implement, the scenario that I would like to implement is this. So suppose there are M people, uh, let's say M equal four, and then at each time, you are rejecting one person at a time, depending on your action choice. Uh, one of them is our friend, which is smiling here. Uh, and, but you cannot see the identity of each person uh, for some reasons. Now, you are rejecting one person at a time. And eventually, uh, until, until, one, until one, only one person survives. Now, if your action choice was correct at all times, then the surviving person would be our friend. But only a single one-time wrong choice would, would reject, ends up rejecting our friend. So uh, because you cannot see the identity of each person um, until, you, until the, the last moment, uh, and actually you get a reward, you, you don't know which person you dropped in the middle. So basically, in order to see uh, at least one time when your friend survived, you need to explore most of all A to the M possible action sequences, which gives us the A to the M lower bound. So this is the type of scenario that I would love in a latent MTP framework. 
And uh, each person here corresponds to our friend, uh, corresponds to each one, each MDP in the LMDP instances. So now we construct the, the model. Uh, now consider an MDP where uh, every time step, you either go to the next state or fall into the sync state. And if you fall into sync state, you cannot get out of it for that episode. Now, for the, now in the first MDP, this one corresponds to the smiling face in the previous slide. It goes to the next state only under the correct action. And it falls into the sync state when the choice of the action was wrong. And it will it will give a reward only under the only when all actions were correct. Now all other MDPs exist there to confuse the right actions at all time steps. For example, the nth MDP will confuse the first correct action. So this one sends the uh, the agent to the sync state under the correct correct choice of action and for all wrong actions it will uh, move the agent to the next state so uh, and after this uh, first time step this mth mdp will behave exactly the same as the first mdp so now what happens is that when we don't know what is the right action a1 at the first time step after uh, this action any action taken here uh, we still don't know whether what we dropped is the first MDP or the nth MDP. And then, uh, and, and so this nth MDP confuses the first right action. There are other MDPs that confuses the second right action. So this one just moves forward until the second time step, no matter which action we take. It sends the agent to the sync state uh, when the action is wrong, uh, is right. And, and and moves sends the agent to the next state for all wrong actions. And then after this time step, it behaves exactly the same as the first MDP. So what happens is, even if we passed two exams and we survived until the third time step, we still don't know which one is surviving. Is it the first, nth, or n minus one? And all other MDPs are constructed, constructed in a similar way. So uh, this construction obfuscates the correct action sequence. So to see this, we can draw a Markov chain um, that whose, uh, whose uh, sequence generated from this Markov chain is equivalent to the distribution of sequences that is generated from our hard instance with any actions. So at the first time step, we know we start from one of M MDPs with equal probability. Uh, with probability one over M, for any action, we fall into the sync state, and for all rest of the probability, we move to the next state. But in the next state, we know we are in one of M minus one MDP, M minus one MDPs, but we don't know whether it's whether it's gone is the first MDP or nth MDP, and so on. So uh, again, this construction, this equivalent Markov chain, uh, generates the transition sequence uh, that is equivalent to the outcome of uh, the observations with any action sequences. And so, this what we concluded here is that until we know that if the action sequence is wrong, the first MDP is never going to survive till the end. And uh, so, so for all wrong action sequences, we cannot see the reward at all, but there is zero information gain from uh, the sequence, the transition sequences, which means uh, we can only gain the information only when we see the reward, uh, but then we have to basically explore almost all possible A to the M action sequences uh, to play the correct action sequence at least once. So which this leads to uh, A to the M lower bound. 
And uh, so far, I talked about the A to the M lower bound, but we can easily lift it up to the SA to the M lower bound. We can basically construct, uh, construct a tree where each node is the state and branch arts are actions. So this tree represents a uh, one big state with order of SA actions. And then we can apply the same argument uh, as uh, before. And this gives us a SA to the M lower bounds. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to address one extra question. Whenever H is greater than M, should A to the H be a lower bound? And uh, so this, this matters because in other community, sometimes the dependency on the exponential dependency on time horizon matters, which is why uh, we don't want to use absolute greedy Q learning uh, in theory. So what you find is that if all MDPs are deterministic, then there is an algorithm that gives us an SA to the M upper bound. So we suspect that even for general and LMDPs with all stochasticity in all MDPs, uh, there might be an upper, the upper bound might be SA to the M. But it is an open question whether we can actually find such an algorithm. So uh, the take home message here, I will wrap up with the take home messages. Uh, we studied the latent MDP. This is the framework lifted up from the standard MDP setting with a single latent variable. We show that there is exists an exponential gap in the number of components when we, uh, so it's SA to the M when we don't assume anything and it's polynomial in our parameters uh, if we have an access to the true context in hindsight. And finally, we argued how to bridge the gap uh, with the proposed LUCRL plus EM algorithm under some assumptions. And we think this is just the beginning of the story uh, and lots of open problems are waiting for us. So first, we, th we think uh, it is important to consider much, consider milder assumptions, uh, but uh, where the expo efficient exploration is possible. Um, and for small number of contexts, we also wonder whether we can get a general SA to the M upper bound. We also think it is important to balance between assumptions and efficient learning. Uh, so we hope you can find more natural and useful subclasses of uh, uh, sub useful assumptions in, in the future. Uh, this is all I prepared today and I greatly appreciate your attentions. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there immediate questions before we go into discussion? Yeah. There were some questions. So Mirko was asking, uh, he says it's not necessarily related to construction, but can we say there is an optimal deterministic policy in this setting uh, for the lower bound construction, I guess? There is, yeah, so the optimal policy is a deterministic action sequence, just playing A1 through AM uh, forever. But the problem is you, we, we have uh, A to the M possibilities. So you have to figure out for this particular uh, MDP, which one is the right one. I have like a more open-ended question, which is related to what I was asking earlier, but if there are some shorter questions, maybe someone can ask that first. Yeah, so so regarding this lower bound, well, you said that well, there is an exponential dependence on M, but in the statement, you also had like this one over M in there as well. So like, can oh. you explain where that comes from? Yeah, yeah, so here, so I said it, this is the num uh, the big state with uh, the order of SA number of actions. But here, if you count the number of states here, the number of states are actually M here, right? Mm -hmm. There are M states. And in this example, there are M times S states in total. So basically to convert it to 
the uh, to the original measure of uh, the size of the state space, uh, we, I had to divide it by n. Right, and then I was just really wondering how this actually behaves for large m, because like, if I look at it, you know, as it is stated now, then this is decreasing. And then, but maybe if you can somehow replace that bound that you have with like one plus SA over m to the m, then for large m, this actually becomes like e to the SA, right? And that, and that is pretty bad. So I'm just wondering, like, can you put like one plus in front of this whole thing? Because then I think I would like understand more clearly what is going on. Isn't it one plus SA still the same order SA? Uh, no, I guess like one plus SA over M, right? So you only divide by M, mm -hmm. S and A, right? But the model remains there. So that does not go to zero as M goes to infinity. Ah. Because the limit of this is, 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 is E to the SA. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, that might be even worse. Um, yeah, well, this is this is something to consider, I guess. Right, and uh, Amir Masood had a question also as well. Like, I don't know if, uh, if you want to ask it, Amir Masood, or uh, you have a microphone at least. Well, so he was he was sort of asking about a, a different setup. Uh, so I'm going to read his question. With the, so he's asking, how difficult is it to identify which context the agent is given, given, given a few steps of interactions? If not too difficult, can we have like a two-phased identify plus execute agent? So I guess what he's saying is that, well, like based on like the first few observations in the episode, can you infer which context uh, you're in, right? And then execute the optimal policy from, for that. Um, and maybe use this as your baseline policy instead of. So uh, if I understand the question correctly, if I'm able to infer the context correctly for the first episode, then can I just run that? Uh, but still, you you but still maybe the you. So infer so inferring the context, I guess is is um a little less uh, of data rather than computing the optimal policy for that model. So I think still you need to compute, uh, you need to gather more data from more episodes uh, in order to get a more correct policy. Yeah, I, th I think this question is more about like uh, your comparator policy, right? That let's say that, well, the class of policies that you want to compare with have the following shape, that for first few steps within the episode, mm -hmm. they dedicate it to identifying what the context ah, is. Ah, I, right? I see, I see. And then for the rest of the episodes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think that is more, uh, actually, I'm interested in the kind of, uh, finding the kind of poli uh, policies, but uh, I haven't uh, yet come up with the formal, uh, formal formal formulation of uh, such policies, how to define uh, the regret or how to define the problem set up so that the inference is possible, like something yeah. like that. But yeah, I but think I, in, in I practical aspects, mm -hmm. in, in yeah, practical I, aspects, I think that's, yeah, that makes much sense, much more sense. Yeah, yeah but to me, this sounds like a weaker policy than what you're comparing yourself with, right? Because you're com comparing yourself with the set of all history dependent policies Yes, and that yes. actually um, includes this set of policies, right? Right, right, right. It's right. Interesting, interesting context right. and executes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in the in the setting like where you have context revealed in the end of the episode, is it clear what the lower bound is? Like do you do we need that dependence on M? Uh for M I guess yes. Uh this is so I guess I can compare it to the setting where you just get the context uh, from the start of the episode, which is basically you're solving m separate empty piece. In that mm -hmm. case, in that case, maybe the lower bound uh, should be you are having uh, one less vector s and one less vector e in h. So root h s m a n might be the lower bound. It's my suspect. I I'm not so sure like that. 
it's equivalent to solving um separate because regret is only weighing every one of them as one by m so it's not entirely clear like for example i compare it to something like bayesian uh like a uh, thumbs and sampling for bayesian regret where so you can imagine these w's to be bayesian prior prior mm -hmm. of the mdps and uh what you are seeing is a sample like a an, an mdp from the prior and you don't know which one it is no it's different from that because uh it's different it is yeah. but it becomes closer once you know afterwards that which mdp it was because you you can kind of update the correct model instead of if if you didn't know then it would be like totally different if you couldn't even apply any of those algorithms but but what i'm saying is that it's not clear that i mean it might be true i i don't know what the lower bound is but it's not clear that it's as hard as solving m mdp learning m mdps because your regret is average over those m right uh-huh uh it's not like it's not like you have to learn everyone to the like you're not having separate regrets for every uh so i so let me uh just just uh iterate reiterate just to make sure that i'm understand the correct question correctly so uh so the regret here so still i'm i'm trying to find an optimal policy in the setting where you in in the latent mdp setting uh and in latent mdp setting so you are your regret is um so your value function is something that you uh so, so basically what my objective is this so basically every episode one MDP is selected, and but you just don't know which which MDP that you are interacting. So you are uh, you have to somehow need to guess uh, while you are getting more data, uh, and this is the uh, expected reward that uh, you get in some MDP every episode. So uh, I guess uh, I'm not comparing to. Uh, the optimal policy for each MDP, uh, because you really cannot um, just run that optimal policy for a specific MDP um, every time. No, I'm not asking. Yeah, I was just wondering what the lower bound would be okay. in the case when you can see. So I'm not totally convinced that the lower bound. It's not obvious to me, let's say like that, uh, that the lower bound. So you, you're asking for this specific case when you for this warm up case, is it right? When you can see the when you can see the context in hindsight, yes. like after every episode, it's yes. not obvious to me that the lower bound will have a dependency mm -hmm. on square root m. Oh, square root m. So because it's not like you have. Your regret is not sum of m different. I'm not, but the underlying so so the but the number of the underlying states is m times s. Do do you agree with that? No. Because because the underlying state is actually the combination of the context and the state that you're observing. No, but but if you think about like the Bayesian setting, for example you still they're also like you see like one of the mdps from the prior that doesn't mean that you have many mdps that but in that setting uh once you sample the model from the prior uh you you just use it forever yeah but you here you're still using it for that episode like so it's not like so yeah for that for that for for one episode i'm using that but for from the, for for entire episodes basically you are experiencing all n times s state different states Whereas in Bayesian, Bayesian setting, for entire episodes, you are just experiencing just one, uh, just one MDP. So the, the the number of states that you experience over the entire time is just S there. So you don't suffer M. But here, every episode you get, you, you get one of new. You have a possibility uh, 
to experience in a new model. So there are MS possible states that you will experience through the, throughout the episode, the entire episodes. So we, we can, yeah, I, I don't, I'm still not convinced that the MS possible states because they're still the same states. The district transition probabilities between them, there's a distribution on those models. Like it's, uh, anyway, yeah, uh, we, there is no proof. He, like we, we don't have a, like, uh, so I, I guess it's all, yeah, my conceptual understanding may be missing something here. I would be happy to discuss more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe someday when we <laughs> meet somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So, so in the chat, uh, yeah. Jean, Jean Lee was asking a question. Jean, are you here? So you can ask a question. So, yes, it was a while back. Yeah. So he he was asking about. Well, whether there exist uh, other results in the literature that compare with the best uh, memoryless policy? Um, so I can uh, restrict the policy class only to a memoryless policies. In that case, the planning oracle just considers uh, all the uh, overall just memoryless only consider memoryless policies. So in that case, I'm just comparing, I'll be just comparing to this, uh, comparing to the best memoryless policies. Uh, uh, so, so, yeah. Uh -huh. so, so, so suggesting that your regret bound continues to hold for the yes, yes. memoryless memory policy as well, but I guess there you have some computational problems that you're running into. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Seems to be a question. Can you talk more about the hidden reward? Is that answered already? So uh, can you talk more about the hidden reward? How would that help learn the policy? So, yeah, this hidden reward is, uh, is only given to the Oracle. The planning oracle just uh, plans uh, to maximize the long-term observable plus hidden rewards. So since planning have all the information, planner planner doesn't, uh, doesn't need to uh, uh, worry about whether the reward is hidden or not, but still, but uh, uh, the reason that uh, the hidden is different from observable is because still the hidden part is never going to be a part of your history because you cannot see it. Um, so yeah, for the agent, when, when, when you compute the policy, you, you cannot uh, insert that hidden part as an input to a policy. But still you can, so think about the uh, standard NDP setting where you run the value, optimistic value iteration. Um, here, the, the hidden part, is also some exploration bonus in some value iteration uh, in the quantities called alpha vectors. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can basically think of it as some, con there is some conceptual difference and you cannot use this hidden part to update to your belief over context, but but still, you can aim to still you can aim to maximize the sum of the double plus items. Right. So Chuan Chuan, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice talk. Thank you for answering my question. Yeah. So I. Uh, I, I actually, yeah, yeah, you uh, already answered my question, and actually, I have a follow up question. So, when uh, do you uh, decide uh, when to use this hidden reward? And first is when uh, to use the the, the observed reward. So, in your algorithm design, I uh, I didn't find the the place where uh, you will use this. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, so hidden reward. I, I'm only using uh, it for constructing optimistic model. 
uh, which mm -hmm. is given as an input to the planning oracle. And then uh -huh. this planning oracle will return me a policy. And then after that, uh, uh, yeah, after, once we get the policy, we are done with so, that hidden reward. I see. So do you suggest that uh, uh, we will only use the hidden reward when we construct the optimistic model amplitude, or uh, we will use both uh, observed and hidden reward when we construct the optimistic model? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh. <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, yeah. So my question was, uh, uh, when we construct this uh, optimistic model, uh, do we need to use only the hidden reward or we need to use both hidden reward and uh, observed reward? Yeah, yeah, we use both, yeah, we use both. Okay, okay. So, and, uh, the, and since you are going to use both, I wonder, uh, do we just add these two together or? Uh, yeah, I just missed the part where uh, you will uh, uh, how you will use this two kind of reward? Uh, uh, so it's it's just uh, I'll, I'll, my target is now just maximizing the long term observable rewards, but I'm targeting maximizing to uh, long term observable plus hidden rewards. Oh, plus. Okay. Okay. I see. Thank you. There is, there is one question from Gabor about in the hard instances, why cannot we identify the context at the end of the episode through the deterministic transitions? Yes. Uh, so uh, my argument was this. Um, if you don't see any, so if you don't get any, so basically the observation sequence in transitions are all the, uh, are all equivalent to one sample from this Markov chain. So if one, uh, you get, if you can, if you don't get a reward at all, then all you get is some, uh, the sequence of, in these transitions. And because all the transition is a sample from this one Markov chain, equivalent Markov chain model, um, you, and okay, and why why we cannot identify the context? So, at the first time step, you uh, move to either to the sync state or to the next state. But whether you choose a one, in that case, you're going to send the nth MDP to the sync state. Um, otherwise, for all other actions, you are sending the first to target MDP to the sync state. And then for all other MDPs, you are just moving to here. So what happens is with probability one over m, uh, from the from the view that who doesn't know the context, just whatever actions you take, you are going to sync with one over m, and you are going to next state with probability one over one minus one over m. But still, you have no guess. You cannot guess whether you dropped the first one or nth one. And this will just continue until the end. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, we cannot guess with, which MDP uh, has been fallen out. Sorry if Gabor is there. OK, he's, he's, uh, he or she says that's is satisfactory. Uh, thank you, uh, Jung. Uh, you, uh, I don't know if uh, Java, you have more questions here unmuted. So I thought. Oh, you're still muted. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I, I did have some questions. I don't know whether you want to stop recording. Uh, not too controversial, but uh, one question I had is whether uh, for the second part, uh, when the true context or the true MDP identity is not revealed at the end, uh, one wonders whether identification of the MDP is really necessary. Uh, 
because some of this whole construction revolves around whether we'll be able to tell the MDPs apart or not. So what if two of MDPs coincide? What if all of them coincide? Well, I don't care then, right? Like that, that's yes, a very yes, lucky exactly. case. Uh, so so uh, uh, if all MDPs are exactly the same, uh, what I guess is that when you estimate the belief over context, uh, mm -hmm. almost all MDPs will um, have equal probability over all contexts. So you're just increasing the count by one over M or so. So basically there is a slowdown that you're increasing, instead of increasing the physical count by one, you're, you're increasing the physical count by one over M there. Uh, but still, the I, I guess the algorithm, I, I guess what, if that's the case, um, all models are converging to the same model um, uh, with this implementation. Yeah. So in that case, it is basically same to uh, not caring about different right. entities. So, so that seems to suggest that there are maybe other regimes. Uh, I'm not sure whether these are algorithms, ideas for those regimes, but. Uh, there could be these other regimes as well where you can have some positive result, uh, right? I guess like the problem is just easy by its nature. I, I don't like, yeah. Yes. Um, some related or, or the other side of the coin though is that again, uh, in this case, when the identity of the true MDP is not revealed at the end, uh, is optimism the right tool in this case? So we sort of know for, you know, similar settings, partial monitoring, whatnot, that when you have an action which is uh, revealing the, the latent information, but that action on its own is not rewarding, then the optimistic algorithms are very happily discarding those actions and will never take them. Mm -hmm. And if you have some more clever algorithm based on ideas or whatnot, then uh, then they can deal with these sort of environments. Not. I, I'm very actually interested in that kind of settings where you you getting a reward for some non uh, identifying actions, but still there are some other actions not rewarding so much, but it's very helpful for rebuilding the uh, yeah. identity. Right, and then one would probably need some other type of target them. Right? I think so, yes, yes. Okay, although it's very interesting that in the first part when you have this uh, identity revealed on its own, like this comment absolutely doesn't apply to that case, right? So in that case, optimism seems to be an okay choice, at least uh, as a first order approximation or something. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree. Yeah. All right, okay, thanks.